I'm also just going to turn this around because it's causing kind of problems. Okay. Well, yeah, might, are you prefer me to use blue paper? Okay. Um, just in case there are call-ins, at least you get the person's name written down. I will give it to you anyway. Uh, you can even, if you have good eyesight. No, I ask you to sit uh, just like this. Okay. On the next chair. Computer. Yeah. Okay. Is there a uh, off? There's a button. Uh, there's a, a Which knob on your left. You see where it is? And it, it controls the volume. Excuse me, sir. I'm going to move this over a couple inches there. Go ahead. You just move it. Which way? This way. Great. Now this does not control volume. It's already Hello. 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 Home entertainment reporter of the New York Times, and you are listening to New York and Company with Leonard Lopez on WNYC AM820, New York Public Radio. <laughs> In the not-too-distant future, your TV set may allow you to turn up the sexual heat on your favorite show or even alter the show's political complexion to suit your taste. Your telephone will receive, sort, and maybe respond to incoming calls like an impeccable British butler. Household appliances will talk to each other so that your fridge can tell your car when you're running short on cheese and your car can then relay the message to you in a voice of anyone you choose, from Marilyn Monroe to Robin Leach. L Leonard, pick up some brie on your way home, will you? The genie behind this magic is the atom of information of the digitalized world, the bit. Digitalized products that have already worked their way into our lives are, of course, the personal computer, CD, CD-ROM, ATMs, voicemail, and on and on, it seems. But to judge from what Nicholas Negroponte has to say in his new book, called Being Digital, just out from Knopf. We have only touched the tip of the digital iceberg. Mr. Negroponte, one of the innovators behind multimedia, is a professor of media technology at MIT and the founding director of MIT's renowned Media Lab, also a columnist for Wired Magazine. I'm very pleased to welcome him to New York & Company. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. So uh, with all of that in mind, why write a book? Why not just stick this stuff on the internet so that people can access it electronically? Real simple. I, first of all, I was motivated to write the book when I discovered that a lot of the kids, 10 to 15 years old, were subscribing to Wired magazine for their parents, mm -hmm. to, for Christmas, in fact, basically to say, Mom and Dad, this is what I do out on the Internet, and this is what I do when I'm digital. So the reason I wrote a book is that the audience really doesn't have necessarily the computing technology, isn't a surfer on the Internet, and this is the medium that that audience reads. I know you, you're uh, you, you're doing what most people do and, and seeing this very much as a generational gap. But uh, I know people who are older than I am who are in love with their computers oh, absolutely. and play with the Internet all the time. And then there are others like me who just don't get it, probably because we have other things we want to do in our lives. You see all of this is rather alienating. Well, you shouldn't see it as alienating. And uh, yes, there are many people who, and especially senior citizens actually right now as a, as a group, are... Uh, migrating to computing much faster than most people. Uh, there is something fundamentally generational. There are almost no American citizens under 20 who are digi not digital, and there are less and less over 30 who are. And uh, this is a temporary phenomenon, but it really is generational. And uh, it shouldn't be alienating because it's simple and it's not about computing anymore. It's about life. Well, the reason I say alienating is because uh, we're, we're eliminating human contact. We watch television, uh, often alone on the couch, just blaring at this thing. We go to, to get our money out of the bank and we go to an ATM machine. We don't interact with a, a teller anymore. And then we sit at our computer and we, uh, we, we go fishing through the internet and maybe we have some kind of a, a contact that way, but... You know, well, the, you know, this is a classic remark and is, is, is just not correct because people well, that's who... that's why you're here. Well, thank you, but, it's, but, it, but evidence shows exactly the opposite, that kids who do spend time on the internet, who do spend time with their computers, are actually, their social 
skills are enhanced. They spend more prime time. In corporate America, people waste so much time in face-to-face -face meetings. If they just did a little bit more electronically, you would find a lot more productivity and, in fact, a lot more fun to spend face-to-face -face time with people. So how would you have written this book differently if you had decided to put it online or make it available electronically? As soon as it's electronic, then it's much more of a conversation. And people, what you would want to do is you'd want to embody in its representation as much as you can from my head so that talking, talking to the computer program would be analogous to talking to me the way you're doing right now. So what I'd want to do is publish, insofar as I could, what's in my head so that you could talk to the computer the way you're talking to me. In the absence of that kind of interactivity, a book, one reflects on it and assembles, in this case, uh, you know, very, very simple chapters, hopefully with not one single word in there that somebody doesn't understand. You'll not, for example, find the word cyberspace ever in that book. But we do find hypermedia and hypertext in words like that. What is hypertext? Well, hypertext is text that allows you to read it not sequentially. In other words, you don't just follow it from the beginning to the end. You can touch a word and then it'll zoom off and bring up definitions of the word. And uh, it has appeared in, you know, more and more in the language. And I guess, yes, you could argue that hypertext maybe is a violation of my rule. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go on any further, let's talk about that title, Being Digital. Now, mm -hmm. digital simply means being, what, two, right? Uh, or or my, I'm digital when I hold up my hand, aren't I? These are digits? Well, that's a different kind of digit. Um, being digital to me is the difference between bits and atoms. And uh, in fact, in writing the book, that, that became very clear. The world of atoms, physical things that we know, like books, has really driven the way we've thought about the world in general, about economy, about politics. Let me give you one very specific example. Uh, a library, every single person in the world would tell you that a library is good, we should have them, they're good for our children, it's good for our country, public libraries are part of the well-being of a country. Now, public library works because it's based on atoms. You physically go there, which means you move your atoms, so to speak, to get there. You then pull a book off the shelf, which is taking it off, and borrow it, let's say, for a week. During that time, it's missing. It's not on the shelf anymore. You bring it back after a week, and let's pretend somebody immediately borrows it again. 52 people have read it in a year. Now imagine the world of bits, that you have these ones and zeros that travel at the speed of light, they're weightless, they have no mass, and a digital library. And all of a sudden, the work is stored in a digital library where 20 million people, without moving from their seat, can go and borrow that book, take it out, bits never go out of print, read it, and basically have violated every single copyright law that we've known. Mm -hmm. since. And we don't think of that in libraries. It's worse than China. It, much worse than China, because what you're doing is in the digital world, and this is why I try to point out to people when they worry about China, yes, you should worry about that, but you've got a much bigger problem coming up much sooner right here on our home turf. So you, you're, you're saying, on the one hand, you're, you are very much a proponent of this new technology. On the other hand, you're saying we, we should not just run into, go into this willy-nilly. We should start thinking about copyrights, uh, intellectual ownership and the like. And another 35 things on the same list, all of which are of the same magnitude. But my point is that this is a big one. Sort of on the Richter scale of social change, this is a 10.5. We've never seen anything like this before. It's going to turn intellectual property upside down. It's going to turn education upside down. It's going to turn commerce upside down. Digital money is going to give the IRS heartburn. I mean, we really are going to basically turn everything upside down. And we can even go further. I want to get into that in just a second. First, tell people that my guest is Nicholas Negroponte, professor of media technology at MIT, also founding director of the Media Lab, a columnist for Wired. Uh, his columns play a major part in the development of his book, Being Digital, which is published by KNA. Uh, you suggest that there are all sorts of fantastic products that might become available uh, these are the sorts of things that uh, science fiction writers thought about in the past, but digitalized fabrics like computing corduroy or memory muslin so that uh, instead of carrying your laptop, you might wear it? Yes. That's and, kind and of silly. Well, you may think it's silly, but uh, 
do recall that this comes at the end of the book where one is trying to look at what are some of the way out things that will happen 10, 15 years from now. And the way to summarize it is that computing will not be embodied in objects like computers, desktop computers, laptop computers, or even for that matter, intelligent TV sets. It will leak into all sorts of things. You will wear it, You will, whether it's your cuff link, whether it's your tie, whether it's an object that you hold, whether it's a smart toaster. All of these common objects, which are principally something else, like they make toast, will also do a lot of computing and will a lot of communicating with each other. And I'm sure you'll appreciate that because I understand that right now, 25% of your luggage is phone jacks, power plugs, and for long flights, you carry 10 pounds of batteries for your laptop. Yes, so, that's so, a... so, so if you can put it all in your trousers, right. in the fabric of your clothing, then you'll eliminate an awful lot of carrying, or will it make it heavier? Well, I hope not to wear 10-pound pants as a result. I think you, you'll find uh, clothing, which is a solar collecting material and helps charge power that is, you know, your, t your tie might be an antenna for a cellular telephone. I mean, you're going to find this Plus kind of stuff. Dilbert's tie. Well, yes. But, but Do you read Dilbert? No, I don't. But it sounds silly. But it's not silly at all. This is really the, the direction we're going. Mm -hmm. Well. The fact that you have to carry all of that stuff is almost like a ball and chain, isn't it? When, when I travel, I don't have to carry all of that stuff. I just watch the lousy movie and eat the terrible food. Yes, but as a consequence, I get an awful lot done so that when I arrive, unlike you, I don't find any work waiting for me. And when I come back to my office from a trip, my desk is by definition empty. It has nothing on it. How did you get involved in this? Um, I got involved in a, in a very strange way. Actually, I'm trained as an architect, and my, you know, all of my degrees are in architecture and, and looked at computer-aided design in the late 60s as a way for architects to, and designers to basically enhance their skills and found very quickly that it was so debilitating to use a computer that my life work has since been to try and make computers more like people, to try and make computers much, much easier to use. Uh, at uh, one, uh, an important event in all of this was the Israeli strike at Entebbe Airport in Uganda. Yes, actually, um, because during the 70s, most of my research was funded by the Department of Defense in the area of human, communi human computer communication. When that particular strike, and the, if you remember, there was a TWA plane that was hijacked, and the the uh, Ugandans sympathized with the hijackers, and the Israelis traveled thousands of miles and made this extraordinary rescue. And the Americans were so impressed, they said, you know, how did this happen? And the way it happened was the Israelis had built in the desert a physical model of that airport because they had, in better times and better relations between Uganda and Israel, they had actually built the airport, so they had the, f the plans. What the pilots and the commandos had was a first-hand experience of landing and taking off from this physical model on the desert. So when they arrived there at 11 o'clock at night, they knew this airport like the back of their hand, and they worked magic very quickly. The Americans said, well, can we do that with a computer, and can we do that with, quote, multimedia? And it became a big project for us to try and replicate the experience of being someplace, which is now sometimes called virtual reality, and it was for us the start of multimedia. But it didn't work when we tried to free the hostages in Iran. Well, by chance, uh, as the technology developed and was actually implementable, the company that was going to you know, implement it for American embassies around the country, uh, sorry, around the world, uh, did not get to the American embassy on time, and uh, it didn't work. The government funded some projects you were involved with at MIT, but there were complaints, weren't there? Some people said that you were charlatan. Oh, there were complaints, and they, they certainly uh, surfaced in the early 80s, where people thought this was all icing and no cake, that it was a lot of sound and light, that it, you know, it was pictures. There were articles at the time. People were writing articles against color. Mm -hmm. These were scholarly journals that said color is not good for you. We don't want color in displays. It's hard to believe this. You mean the, on a computer right. a video screen? On, on, on a computer screen that mm -hmm. why color was bad for you. I mean, this, you've, it's hard to believe sort of 15 years later that people were making those kind of absurd statements. 
And so when we were showing video and, and, and animation and, and high-quality sound coming out of a computer, people said uh, this is, in fact, the government said, don't you dare use the word multimedia because it means nightclubs. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took until basically about 1980.